Hello, everybody. My name is Jose Adam, and I'm a professor at the UPV in Spain. This talk is based on some of the most ambitious experimental campaigns I've participated in so far on structural robustness. I'm dividing my presentation into five parts, as shown in this slide. First, I give some details on structural robustness and progressive collapse. Second, I provide an overview of the research carried out in my research group, Building Resilient. Third, I show three experimental campaigns carried out on large-scale specimens, as shown in these photos. Then I provide the main details of our most challenging ongoing project, Endure, which is funded by the European Research Council. I want to finish this presentation with some final remarks. Probably you are familiar with the terms robustness and progressive collapse. Anyway, let me provide some details on both terms. In recent years, several structural failures have occurred. The causes of these collapses are very diverse, natural disasters, human action, or even the aging of the structures. But all these collapses have something in common, the consequences, which are usually catastrophic. With respect to breaches, in this slide, we have three recent collapses in Taiwan, Mexico City, and Pittsburgh, and regarding building collapses, I've collected three recent examples in Eindhoven, New Orleans, and Jiangsu. We cannot deny that more and more natural disasters occur, and this leads to our buildings being damaged or even collapsing. In this graph, we can see the evolution in the number of natural disasters since the 70s. The current scenario is critical as indicated by the trend for the coming years. Here we have the classification and number of natural disasters that occurred in the last 20 years, which are compared with those that occurred in the previous 20 years. Broads, landslides, strong storms. Here, the effects of climate change are evident. As mentioned before, the consequences of these events are usually devastating when considering the number of total deaths, people affected, and economic losses. These consequences are higher for the last 20 years. Extreme events, including natural disasters, often cause local damage to buildings. Here, the term progressive collapse appears. Progressive collapse is what happens when an initial failure in one part of a structure starts off a domino effect and results in collapsing the whole structure or a large part of it. In this slide, we see three classic examples of progressive collapse. The Ronan Point building in London, which partially collapsed after a gas explosion in one of the floors, the Oklahoma building collapsed after a bomb explosion, and the Quebec Bridge, which collapsed during its construction due to the battling of a few elements only. Here, I'd like to show you some recent examples of progressive collapse. Two buildings, one in Miami and the other in Peniscola, Spain, which collapsed due to the propagation of initial or local failures, and two steel truss bridges, the Mississippi River Bridge, which collapsed due to the failure of a single gasset plate, and the Skagit River Bridge, in which one of the spans collapsed due to the impact of a track on the overhead members of the truss. In all these cases, a local or initial failure caused a domino effect that resulted in a progressive collapse. Within the context of progressive collapse, we find the term robustness, which is understood as the insensitivity to a local failure. In general, a robust structure will be able to activate alternative load paths after a local failure. This means that this local failure will not propagate to the rest of the structure. We see in this slide two examples of local failure in a building and in a steel truss bridge. In both cases, alternative load paths were activated, so the load supported by the failed element was transferred to other elements of the structure, avoiding a progressive collapse. On this slide, we have the only equation that I'm going to show in my presentation. This equation expresses the probability of occurrence of building progressive collapse, and the equation includes the probability of occurrence of a hazard, hazard E, the conditional probability of local damage caused by this hazard, 
and the conditional probability of collapse caused by the local damage. Structural robustness involves working to avoid failure propagation given that the local damage has already occurred. After this short introduction to extreme events, robustness, and progressive collapse, let me give you some details about the research we carry out in building resilience. We are a research group working in the field of structural engineering, and our research aims to improve the resilience of buildings and bridges, for which we mainly work in two areas, structural assessment and structural robustness. Our work in these fields is usually associated with large-scale experimental campaigns combined with computational modeling. We do our research at the ICTEC Institute, which has one of the largest structural test laboratories in Europe. The research we do is now funded by different public entities, such as the European Commission, the European Research Council, or the Spanish Ministry of Science and Innovation. As mentioned before, I want to show three experimental campaigns involving structural robustness. Let's start with the research we did on temporary shoring systems for buildings and the construction. The most frequently used technique to construct reinforced concrete building structures is the shoring of successive floors. This is a complex process involving the load transmission between the slabs and shores. Here we see two buildings in which this technique was used. The construction phase of a building is critical as regards its safety. In this video, we see the collapse of the Havro Hotel in New Orleans during its construction. Considering the consequences of failures in buildings under construction, we work to avoid failure propagation in temporary shoring systems. We have patented a novel load limiter for temporary shoring that works as a structural fuse. This device keeps the load applied to the shores below their maximum capacity, reducing the risk of collapses due to shore failures. This image shows a shore typically used in Europe. The load supported by the upper part of the shore is transferred to a pin, and the pin transfers the load to the lower part of the shore. In this video, we see how we put the load limiter under the pin, controlling the load supported by the shore. In order to validate the behavior of these devices in real buildings, we built a concrete slab in our laboratory. This video shows how we simulated the construction process. The first step, shoring and formwork. Then the reinforcement is being placed. Next step, slab casting. And here we see that 50% of the shores were removed. This is called clearing process or partial striking. And finally, we use water pools to simulate the casting of the second floor. Design guidelines for temporary works are now introducing clauses to avoid progressive collapse. In view of this, we perform computational simulations to assess the robustness of buildings and the construction. In this video, we see how the failure of a shore propagated to the rest of the shoring system. Here, slab number one was subjected to large displacement and severe cracking. We performed the same simulation, including low limiters in short. Here, we compare the behavior of the building and shoring in two situations. In figure A, low limiters are not used. And in figure B, the low limiters are used in all the shores. If we use low limiters, the failure of a short does not propagate to the rest of the shoring system, avoiding cracks in the slabs. Recently, we've been working on two experimental campaigns on full-scale buildings. With this research, we wanted to improve the robustness of reinforced concrete building structures. In this slide, we see the real-scale specimens we tested, a concrete flat slab building structure with four spans measuring 10 by 10 meters in plan. This building was tested under the sudden removal of corner columns in two scenarios and a precast concrete building structures with six spans measuring 15 by 12 meters in plan. And here the building was subjected to three different sudden removal scenarios. 
Our tests were complex and highly challenging, so the specimens were heavily monitored. In the testing site, we had an acquisition system and we used different techniques and equipment. The strain gauges in the reinforcement bars, displacement sensors, accelerometers, and high-speed cameras. In total, we used more than three kilometers of cable to connect all the sensors. The load applied on the slabs was according to Euro codes, for which we use concrete blocks as shown in this video. Here we see the precast building with concrete blocks in two spans. There are different options for suddenly removing a column. In our test, we designed a special collapsible column as shown in these images. This column has three hinges with a blocking system in the middle. After releasing the blocking system, the column becomes unstable and collapses. This way of working is safer than using explosives or other techniques. In these photos, we see the construction of the flat slab building structure. The foundation, columns before and after casting concrete, casting concrete in the slabs, and the building ready for testing. As mentioned before, this building was subjected to the sudden removal of corner columns in two scenarios. This video shows the first test. After removing the corner column, the structure activated alternative low paths, avoiding a progressive collapse. In the second test, we wanted to analyze the contribution of infill walls when a corner column is removed. This video shows the test. Clearly, the infill walls collaborated with the structure for activating alternative low paths. In this test, the vertical displacement in the removed column was lower than in the other test. Moving on to the precast structure, this is the specimen we tested, which is similar to precast structures typically used in Europe. Here we see one of the beam column connections we use. We wanted to use low cost connections by using typical detailing in precast construction. In order to provide continuity as required by current codes, the reinforcement of the beams pass through the column. As we'll see later, these connections work very well in the test. In this video, we see the construction of the building and how the different components were assembled. Here, the columns are being assembled. You see that we had some rainy days in Valencia during this period of time. Next step, assembling beams. Next, assembling hollow core slabs. We've seen this part of the video. Next, uh, casting concrete on the slabs. And finally, the building is ready for testing. Now, I want to show you the three tests. In this slide, we see the first test. A corner column was removed. This simulation with the applied element method shows what we don't want to happen. And here we see the removal of the corner column. This test was a success. The second test was on an edge column where three beams were connected. The hollow core slabs here were parallel to the facade beams. We want to avoid this situation. And this is what happened in the test when the column was removed. In our last test, we removed again an edge column. This time, only two beams were connected to the column. The hollow core slabs here were resting on the facade beams, as shown in the slide. This simulation shows the critical situation, and here we see that the striker resisted the column removal. After describing our latest experimental campaigns, now I'd like to provide an overview of our most challenging and growing project. This table shows the main details of the project. The project was funded by the European Research Council in the 2020 Consolidator Grant Call. The acronym is Endure and the title, Fuse-Based Cementation Design, Avoiding Failure Propagation in Building Structures. The total budget is 2.5 million euros. We know that the aim of cavern building design philosophies for avoiding progressive collapse is that when a critical element fails, for example, a column, alternative load paths should exist to redistribute its load to the rest of the structure. This is normally achieved by providing a building with extensive continuity. 
through suitable tagging systems. Designs based on current approaches have been effective in many stream situations. For example, after the terrorist attack on the Cobalt Towers, shown in this picture, actually, this building suffered major damage without collapsing. However, in certain scenarios, our design philosophies are ineffective or even increase the risk of progressive collapse. In these situations, when slabs and beams are firmly tied together, the risk of progressive collapse may actually be increased. The continuity means that when a part of a building collapses, it pulls the other zones leading to further collapse. In view of this, new research is necessary to get over the limitations of the present design philosophies. To address these limitations, Endure aims to develop a novel piece-based cementation design approach to arrest failure propagation in building structures. This new approach is similar to how electrical networks are protected against overloads by connecting different segments with electrical fuses. We want to protect buildings against progressive collapse by connecting building segments with structural fuses. These fuses will provide continuity for normal loads or small initial failures, yet will separate the different segments in situations in which failure propagation is inevitable. This approach is radically different to anything done up to now to avoid building progressive collapse. It combines, for the first time, the advantages of two opposite concepts, continuity and segmentation. The project includes three experimental campaigns, two campaigns in the lab to test fuses, both individually and implemented in two-dimensional frames, and another campaign in an outdoor site to implement and validate the new approach in three full-scale buildings. Let's finish this presentation with some final remarks. The structural robustness needs have changed over time. The first, is, the first guidelines appeared after the collapse of the Roland Point building in London, and here the concern was the lack of continuity between precast components. Years later, there was a boom in research and standardization. This occurred after the terrorist attacks in Oklahoma and New York. Here, the priority was terrorism. Currently, two of the greatest concerns of structural engineers are the effects of climate change and the aging of our buildings. We are now designing buildings that, due to climate change, will have to withstand actions that we cannot quantify. There are also many buildings with a certain age that are not prepared to withstand the actions to which they may now be subjected. Here, a structure of robustness plays a key role. We must include robustness designs for new buildings, as well as define strategies to improve the robustness of existing buildings. Regarding our contribution to structural robustness, the use of low limiters in shoring systems is associated with new design philosophies for the construction of building structures. With the research on reinforced concrete building structures, we have defined new design strategies to improve the robustness of casting place and precast building structures. In our ongoing project, Endure, we are defining a new design philosophy based on connecting building segments with the structure of fuses. And now we are, we are exploring retrofitting techniques for existing buildings based on hanging floors from stiffening beams on the top of buildings. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.